um, so I apologize if I'm a little hard to understand. I had the surgery on my jaw last week and it's still numb and it's still hard for me to talk a lot. So I'm going to do this video probably, or the story probably in three videos. So our genre is an informational text, meaning this is all fact-based and true. The title is Life um, from Life on Earth and Beyond. Um, our background says, an astrobiologist, Dr. Chris McKay, studies life in the universe to answer an important question. Is there life on other planets? McKay, so when they say just McKay, that's his last name. They're just referencing him. And other astrobiologists look for signs of life in extreme climates on Earth. Then they compare those findings to the information they have about climates on other planets, such as Mars, to see if life could exist there. Okay, the first part, this is a heading right here, um, between a rock and a cold place, and it says the dry valleys of Antarctica. Question, can life survive in a very cold, dry place? So right here, this would be the heading, and then this stuff in the blue would be its subheading, sub meaning below the blow the heading here we go paragraph one at the very bottom of the globe in a land of ice and snow there are great curving valleys of bare earth antarctica's dry valleys it's a harsh place meaning it's hard to live there in april the beginning of the antarctic winter the sun goes down and doesn't come up again until september for months, the dry valleys are locked in frozen darkness. So yes, in Antarctica, there are periods of complete darkness. There isn't a single scraggly weed or tiny insect. The dry valleys are almost as lonely as outer space. The Antarctic dry valleys, the dark places in the satellite photo, so any of these dark brownish places, are the largest ice-free areas in Antarctica, meaning there is no ice in these, or snow. No, my dogs are bark starting to fight. It's not good. All right, so yet the dry valleys fascinate astrobiologists like Chris McKay. The dry valleys are like Mars, explains Chris. Both are cold and dry. It hardly ever snows in the dry valleys, and when it does, the air is so cold that very little snow ever melts. Mars is even colder and drier. Chris set off to visit the dry valleys in January 2005 during the Antarctic summer. And remember, that is different than our summer. Just getting to such a remote spot was an adventure. Remote means like a place where there's like nobody there. So here we go, we have, this is Antarctica. Um, over here, we have some ice shelves, and I'll explain that, what that is in a minute. Here is where he is, and there's dry valleys. It says, along the edges of Antarctic, Antarctica are huge shelves. All right, so let me say that one more time. Along the edges of Antarctica are huge ice shelves. And these are thick floating platforms of ice. So think of them as like giant ice cubes. The Ross Ice Shelf near McMurdo Station is the size of France. The Antarctic Dry Valleys are also nearby. All right, here is another heading that we have. It's called Journey to the Bottom of the Earth. To reach the dry valleys, Chris flew from San Francisco, California to New Zealand. In New Zealand, he boarded an Air Force cargo plane to McMurdo Station in Antarctica. The cargo plane had no reclining seats or meal service, no windows either. It was eight hours of being cramped and cold and so noisy you had to wear earplugs, Chris later recalled. So here is um, Chris and his team getting ready to board the um, cargo plane. A cargo, cargo is 
basically means like packages, things that you just take along. It's not meant for people. So Chris and seven other scientists took many boxes of equipment to Antarctica, which is probably why they needed the cargo plane because they had to bring all these supplies. They didn't have to bring everything, however. The scientists had special cold weather clothing and camping gear from the National Science Foundation, an agency that coordinates American research in Antarctica. They didn't have to pack food either. Chris and the other scientists went shopping at McMurdo Station's supermarket, and supermarket is in these quotation marks, meaning it's not really a supermarket like we're thinking of Walmart or, or Meyer or even Kroger, because it is a big metal hut full of groceries. After stuffing two helicopters with camping gear, equipment, food, and water, the scientists flew to the dry valleys. They landed atop a giant lump of sandstone called Battleship Promontory. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It would be their home for the next two weeks. Heading, Little Green Men. Early on his first morning in the dry valleys, six foot, six inch Chris wormed his way out of his extra long sleeping bag. I think they included this detail just so you know how tall he is. So you guys all know I'm super tall. I'm five foot. I would say Mr. Barker is probably the closest person we have to being six foot, but he's not even six foot. Maybe our new fourth grade teacher, um, Mr. King, is over six feet tall. Um, but this detail is included in there just to give you an idea um, of maybe how, how his life is going. So he had an extra long sleeping bag. I wouldn't need that. There was plenty of light outside. The sun is up 24 hours a day during the Antarctic summer. So just remember, the winter, it's there's no sun for 24 hours a day. But in the summer, it's always sunlight. There's never darkness. Even during the summer, the dry valleys were as cold as a Montana winter. Chris dressed quickly and made his way through the scientist tent camp. The chilly wind cut like a razor. Oh, hey, we just got a, that is a um, simile right there. It's not really a razor. It's comparing the wind, how it feels when it hits your skin, to maybe getting cut by a razor blade. Even though um, he had these down-filled clothing. Down are the feathers. Um, so you guys probably have, if you don't have one, you've probably seen the big poofy jackets, the puffer jackets that are stuffed with flower or feathers. That is down. The camp was a little tent city. There was a science tent, a kitchen tent, a toilet tent, and the suburbs. Again, these are in um, quotation marks here, which they are calling the sleeping tents. Solar panels powered the kitchen tent. Well, that's a really good idea to use solar panels because in the summer, they have sunlight 100% of the time. So they can be collecting that sun, that energy from the sun to make electricity. So solar panels powered the kitchen tent, fondly nicknamed Ca Cafe Battleship. That's the name of the tent that has the kitchen. Chris treated um, his companions to pancakes with canned cherries on top. Cleaning up was easy. The scientists just wiped everything with paper towels and let the dishes freeze. Nothing rotted or spoiled in the cold, dry air. Well, that's kind of cool. I do like not having to do dishes. And here is a picture. This is the camp on Battleship promontory. At the end of the trip, helicopters flew out every piece of trash and human waste. Yeah, so here's all the tents. I am going to tell you, we had a huge conversation about the toilet tent and human waste last year, um, and we will get to that at another time. All right, this picture says, this is the view from Chris's tent. In 2005, there was more snow than usual. So Remember, they said they hardly ever got snow, but in this picture, there is snow. Chris had been making these camping trips to Antarctica for 25 years. 
He knows there are creatures hidden in the dry valleys that can survive some of the world's worst weather. Their secret, they live inside rock. Solid rock isn't always solid. Many rocks are honeycombed with little spaces or pores that seem to like huge caverns to super small creatures called microbes. Microbes, also called microorganisms, so those are synonyms, are the tiniest of all living things. They are so small that they can't be seen without a microscope. I'm going to pause and I'm going to show you a picture of a rock that isn't solid. Okay, so this is a rock I happen to have. You can, and I'll put it close. You can see it has little holes in it. This stone or rock is actually called pumice, but this is what he's talking about. The little microbes can go and live in those tiny little holes. Okay, paragraph 12. After breakfast, Chris headed to the nearby sandstone cliffs. He examined the sandstone carefully. Chris spotted little blotches on the rock. A colony of microbes was living in pores just under the surface. So those holes like I have here, those would also be called pores. With a hammer and a chisel, he carefully chipped off a chunk of rock to take back to his lab at NASA. On previous visits, Chris had drilled tiny holes into sandstone and attached sensors. The sensors measured the light and the moisture inside the rocks year round. Chris's sensors showed that the microbes hidden in the rocks survived on tidbits, which means itty bitty pieces, of summer sunlight and a few drops of snow melt. So snow melt would be, if snow melts, what does it become? Water. So these microbes are surviving on light and water. So these microbes would be more considered a plant-based, maybe a fungus of some sort, a bacteria, um, who knows? But this I find this pretty interesting that something can survive on just a little bit of sunlight. Just think, how much sunlight are they getting if they're in these little pores? Looking carefully, Chris also spied a wet spot on the rock. When that happens, there are microbes cheering, yay, wet snow! They're not really, because they cannot talk. Chris later explained, they are living in little rock greenhouses. They're waking up for a few days in the summer when the sun is shining and a little moisture seeps through, down through the pores in the rock. They grow a little and then they go back to sleep for the rest of the year. Chris chipped off another rock sample. Just under the rock surface was a th thin green line a, that's not the word minute, it's the word minute, minute meaning extremely small, forest of microbes, cyanobacteria and fungi. Fungi is a fungus. These microbes are, were real survivors. If life exists on Mars, it might look something like that, Chris later explained. Those little green critters, which are the microbes, are the best Martians we have. And everyone knows Martians are little and green. Here he's just being silly. A shelter of rock or dirt would have been very important for any Martian life. The atmosphere on Mars is too thin to block dangerous radiation from the sun. If any life exists on Mars, it would need to be shielded, which is like protected, from solar radiation by rock or soil. But microbes hiding inside rocks or underground aren't easy to find. So Chris used the dry valleys as a testing ground for microbe detection machines. I'm gonna explain this picture and then I'm gonna stop the video and we'll make a, another video. So um, a closer look at the small dark patch exposes the cyanobacteria and fungi. So right here, this dark line is what he sees and that's actually, the close-up shows what he's seeing here. That's actually um, microbes, which are like the little bacterias. The snow melt reaches the microbes that are hidden inside the rock. Doesn't seem that interesting to me, but you know what? Science um, 
they need all these information in order, in order to make big discoveries. So I'll be back with another video.